His kingdom come. Hey, good morning. We love that we have the opportunity to connect with you here online this morning. If you're new here at Lake Sawyer, we'd love to invite you to one of our favorite digital spaces called Next. This is a place where you can learn more about Lake Sawyer and how to take your next steps. We will be hosting, hosting one on August 25th at 6 p.m. If you'd like to sign up, just go to lakesawyerchurch.org forward slash next. We'll even take care of your dinner costs for that evening by gifting you with a DoorDash gift card. We would love to get the chance to meet you and we hope to see you there. Hey everybody, hope you're having a great summer. Can you believe we've got like three weeks left? I mean, we're three weeks away from Labor Day weekend and I hope you're getting all the sunshine in that you possibly can. We want to give you a heads up of what's coming up though following Labor Day weekend. We want you to stay tuned because you're going to start hearing about two different types of groups that we're going to be launching. We're going to see more short-term groups. If you've been around Lake Sawyer at all, you know how we've done those the last couple quarters. You're going to see more of those options come up. Great opportunity for you to step in for four to six weeks in a group experience, short-term commitment, but really get a feel for what that's like. But you're also gonna be hearing about community groups and community groups are new groups that we're launching this fall. They're gonna start around the beginning, middle of October, and these are long-term groups. These are about 16-month long groups that you can become a part of. It gives you a chance to really build relationships with other people and really get to know and kind of build that intimacy that will really help you in your spiritual journey to find and follow Jesus. So stay tuned for those things coming up. Again, about the week after Labor Day weekend, you're gonna start seeing them uh, promoted and you'll have opportunities to sign up. I can't wait for you to get involved. Hey mamas, do you have kids ages infant through preschool? If so, God bless you. But also, I want to tell you about an amazing community of women just like you who meet twice a month right here on campus. It's called Black Diamond Mops. Mops stands for Mothers of Preschoolers. And right now, registration is open for the upcoming season, which starts in September. This team has been working hard on making some really great plans for the new year. So if you're a mom expecting a baby or have children infant through preschool, MOPS is a great place to meet other moms in the same stage of life as you. A place to find friendships and community, a place to connect. So to register or learn more about MOPS, go to lakesawyerchurch.org slash MOPS and check it out today. One of the things I love the most about Lake Sawyer is the people I have been able to connect with and do life with over the years I've been here. I'm grateful to be a part of a church that values and encourages community and togetherness, even in this weird season that we find ourselves right now. One place I found my community of friends has been around a table studying the Bible together with other women. Do you know that we have groups of women who are gathering and studying the Bible together even in this season? There are groups who are meeting virtually and opening the pages of scripture to discover God together. And in so doing, they're also learning about themselves and fostering friendships and community along the way. If this is something that you're missing in your life, I want to encourage you to consider joining a women's study group. You can shoot me an email at jlawless at lakesawyerchurch.org and it would be my honor to help you find the right fit for you. Hey, just before the message, we're going to be giving you an opportunity to send Mike questions regarding his message this morning, which will be posted on social media later this week. So if you'd like your questions answered, email your questions to questions at lakesawyerchurch.org. Now, on to the message. At some point in our lives, all of us find ourselves in a season where we're going through it. A season where the struggles seem insurmountable, where it seems like life has spiraled out of control, 
where it seems like we've been knocked down and we can't find a way to get back up. Unfortunately, those seasons seemingly are just a part of life. But then you overlay the realities of this past season, of the things that we've been dealing with over the last couple of months. Many of us have been gearing up to send our kids back to school, and by back to school, I, I mean back to the kitchen table. Some of us have felt financial pressures. Some of us have been struggling with our own health or have been working through and helping a loved one deal with some of their health issues. Maybe you've lost a job in this season. I think it's fair to say in this season, in some way, shape, or form, all of us, we're going through it. We're wearing the weight of this season. And when we find ourselves in moments just like this, it's hard for us to see beyond the moment. It's hard for us to see beyond the present struggles and realities. And I know that I'm not alone in that experience. But see, one of the things I love about the Bible is that the Bible speaks to our lives. It speaks to our lives in every season of life. It helps inform our realities and our experiences because when we open the pages of the Bible, we find people who are just like us, whose struggles are just like us, whose journeys are very similar to our own. We find people whose lives are filled with difficult moments and their stories and God's timeless word help us navigate the uncertainty that comes with every season. It helps us make sense of a nonsensical world. And the Bible, the beauty of the Bible is it's so much more than just information. That The purpose of the Bible is to do so much more than just inform us. Matter of fact, it's been said that many books, many books will inform you. But only the Bible can transform you. Only the Bible can transform me. Only the Bible can transform our lives. The keys to life are found in the pages of God's Word. You see, with that at the forefront of our minds, this weekend we're kicking off a brand new teaching series on the book of Colossians. And here's a little bit of a spoiler alert for you. It's one of those books of the Bible that speaks directly to some of the issues that we're facing as people in this season of life. Now, before we jump right into Colossians, I want to take a second or two just to help kind of give some context, help us give a bigger picture or understanding of what's going on in this letter um, to the church in Colossae. Colossians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul, one of the early leaders of the church, to a Christ-following group of people there in Colossae. Colossae is an ancient city in Asia Minor, and for geographical context, to kind of put it a, a picture on a map today, it would be located in the southwestern part of present-day Turkey. See, Colossae wasn't just an ordinary city. It was a city strategically located along key trading highways, which led to a diverse population and incredible regional significance. Colossae was an important city. And Paul writes a letter. He pens a letter to this group of Christ followers in this city. Now, the church there is different than many of the other churches that Paul writes letters to. Paul didn't start this church. That wasn't one of the churches he started on one of his missionary journeys. We actually don't know who started the church in Colossae, but what we do know is Paul had a deep connection to this church. His heart was drawn to this church, even in his present circumstances. Do you remember how I said that all of us, we find ourselves in seasons where we're going through it? Well, this is one of those seasons for Paul. When Paul writes this letter to this church, he's not doing so from the comfort of his home. He's writing this letter to them in prison. Now, we know because the Bible informs us that Paul was in jail twice. 
And, and each of his terms in prison, they looked a little bit different. The, the second time that he was in prison more closely resembled what we would think about is jail time today. But the first time he was in prison, the time where he would have sat down and wrote this letter to the church in Colossae was more like house arrest. Or, or to put it in today's terms, Paul was on a stay-at-home order. And all of us know that's the kind of thing that can do some things to you. Because we know what it's like to be stuck at home. We know what it's like to not be able to leave our house. We know what that can do to a person. Like at first, it might seem like it's a little, little fun, a, a giant camp out in your house, a celebration, an opportunity for family to reconnect. But over time, over time, even for the most introverted of us, it can begin to feel oppressive. It loses its luster. It loses some of the fun associated with it. It begins to feel like walls are closing in all around us. We, we, we desire to get out. We have an itch to go for a walk, to grab a bite, to eat, to do something. But we can't because we have to stay home. That experience, that feeling that most of us wrestled with and dealt with during that stay-at-home order would be some of the same things that Paul is dealing with right now. I would assume that any letter he would write from these conditions would be written from a dark place, a place of anger, perhaps frustration, perhaps a place of depression. Yet this is actually how we see Paul open his letter to the church in Colossae. This is what he says beginning in Colossians chapter 1 in verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven. This is one of the things I absolutely love about Paul. That no matter how bad it seems... No matter how difficult his situation is, he never seems to lose sight of what matters the most, even in the most difficult of circumstances. See, he doesn't allow his present experience to get in the way of the work that God has for him. Even when he's going through it, even when Paul is just going through it, he doesn't lose sight of the opportunity he has to help other people through their same difficult seasons. And that is true of this church here in Colossae. They are going through it. They are in a difficult place. They are in a tough season. And the thing is, we don't know some of the specifics that center around their struggles. But we do know that Paul, in this first chapter, is trying to help them, trying to encourage them, to be able to see through some of their current struggles, to not get discouraged. We all get discouraged. We all get overwhelmed when life, it's, when it's overwhelming. And life has a way of feeling overwhelming. It's part of what it means to be human. And that's why I believe Paul's words here are more valuable than ever because they help remind us of the one who can get us through the seasons that we're going through. This is what Paul writes, we begin still in Colossians 1 and verse 15. He says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. You see, Paul reminds us that Jesus is the physical manifestation of God. <laughs> It's one of these corny things I'm going to say, but you won't forget it. Jesus is God in a bod. You're welcome. I know it's, it's cheesy, it's corny, but you'll remember it. He's a physical manifestation of the invisible God. He's God in a bod. And then what Paul says is that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Now, here's the thing. Scholars debate exactly what Paul's intent here is. 
Uh, there, there's, there's really two viewpoints that are, uh, that are up for question. One, certain scholars believe that that title, the firstborn over all creation, is a title of respect. It alludes to the preeminent nature of Jesus, that he is the firstborn. And in the ancient world, there's familial authority that is tied to being the firstborn. So people say that's an acknowledgement. It's an acknowledgement of his preeminence, of his position, of being the firstborn. Two, another group of scholars say it's actually a reference to his position as the Messiah. And the evidence for that is found in a reference from Psalm 89. But here's what I would say. Both positions, whatever one you choose, elevates the person, the role, the authority, and the significance of Jesus. And that is what matters the most. Paul continues, verse 16, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Paul says, look, look, heaven and earth were created in him. The things that you see and that you don't see were created in him. Thrones, yep, those were created in him. Powers, yep, that ruler, absolutely, yep. Those authorities, yes, those authorities too. And then Paul reminds the church, he reminds us the why, that it's all been created through him and most importantly, for him. That everything in this world, the things that we see and the things that we can't see, the things that we think we control and the things that we don't even know there, there is out there, those things, all things were created for him. Now, here's the thing. I know at this point, someone has an issue with what I'm saying. Because at some point, it's in someone's mind to think, well, what, that ruler? Wait, you're, you're saying that, that God created that ruler? Or or that God created those authorities or those powers? Are are you saying that, that, that God has done some of the things that we experience, some of the things we believe are negative experiences in our reality? Did Jesus really create that thing? And I can't answer that question. Because the truth is, that's not the point that Paul is making. What Paul is saying is that all of it, even that, that thing that you can't imagine that God would create, if that's what you think, even that thing, the the point that Paul's making isn't that Jesus created it. The point that Paul's making is even that thing is under his authority, that he has the power over it, that God is ultimately in control of everything that we experience in our world. It's not beyond the scope of his power. And it's not just present things. This is true of things throughout history. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He was there before it all. And Jesus holds it all together. And he is the head of the church. And Paul isn't thinking organizationally or institutionally. He is the head of God's people, the church is the collection of God's people called out on mission together. And, and Jesus is our head. So that, so that in absolutely everything, he might have supremacy. And now that word supremacy, it throws us there because it's not, it's not a word that we use often. And so allow me just to take a second to maybe rephrase Paul's words here, maybe rephrase Paul's point. What he's saying is that Jesus holds it all together, that he is the head of our lives. So keep him first. And that's what he means by supremacy. Keep him 
first. It's an acknowledgement of the primacy of Jesus in our lives, that he must be first. He must be number one. And, and Paul is reminding the church in Colossae of this, because the reality is in this moment, in this season where they're going through it, they have chosen to put something else or someone other than God first in their lives. They have made the issues in front of them more important than the God who was with them. And let's be honest with ourselves for a moment. We do this. We all do this. We do it all the time. We misorder our priorities. We don't do it intentionally, but it happens. It happens because the struggles and the realities of the life that we see around us, they're huge. They're daunting. They are at times overwhelming and we don't know what to do. And so we get discouraged. But here's the thing. We don't have to be discouraged. We don't. Because if we're turning to the one, Jesus, who can get us through what we're going through, this discouragement doesn't have to be our reality. It will be unless we're turning to the one who can get us through what we're going through. The problem is many of us allow our present experience to define us. We get fixated on the issues that are in front of us and that's part of our problem because we need not, need not to look at the issue. We need to be looking to Jesus. We need to commit to put him first, which I understand is difficult to do. Paul continues in verse 19, for, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You see, Paul's point here to the church in Colossae, and it's a point that is good for us to take heed of as well, is that Christ is enough. That Christ is all they need. They're, it's all that they needed. Christ is all that we need. Because when his blood was shed on the cross, everything, everything changed. That's why one of the things we say here so often at Lake Sawyer is that Jesus changes everything for everyone. That Jesus changes everything for everyone. Because on the cross, death was defeated. The cross says death no longer has a hold on us. The cross says death doesn't get the last laugh. That all of the powers and the control that this world has over us went away when we surrendered our lives to Jesus. And if you want to get through the things that you're going through, you got to surrender your life to Christ. You got to acknowledge that this life is not yours, it's His. It's not under your authority, it's under His. And I'm going to be honest with you I need that reminder. I need to remember that more than I care to admit. Because the truth is, when I'm going through it, I have a tendency to try to manage it myself. I have a tendency to lose focus on putting God first. And odds are, you do too. It's what the church in Colossae struggled with. They lost sight. They lost focus on their first love and the power that he, Jesus, has to transform and shape lives. And so Paul, in this beautiful letter, he, he attempts to encourage them, to remind them of this truth. He says, once you were alienated from God. And were enemies in your minds because of your, your evil behavior. We're all separated from God. Our minds, our pursuits, our passions, they were focused on other things. But God refused to allow those actions to create 
a separation between us. And so God did what God does. He acted. God chose to pursue us even as we actively pursued something else. And this is how he did it. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present, to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And so in spite of those pursuits, in spite of our behaviors, Paul reminds us that when we place our lives in Jesus, when we say yes to following Jesus, that that act, that act of surrender and submission puts us before God without a blemish. That we are freed from the accusations of our past. That we, don't miss this, that we are made new. That we are a new creation. And I know that there's someone who is listening in today who hasn't taken that step of saying yes to Jesus. Uh, someone who's tuning in this morning who hasn't trusted their lives to Jesus. And I know, and I understand. I, I, I get how difficult of a decision that can be because I was there. I've, I've been in your shoes. Like, like you, I've tried to get through some of the most difficult seasons of life on my own. Like you, I've tried to carry the weight of my world, and it's heavy. I got tired. Ultimately, I got to the point where I realized that what I was doing wasn't working and that I needed to let go. And if that's where you're at today, if you're tired of carrying the burden of your life, if you're tired of carrying the weight of your world, if you're tired of trying to navigate the seasons when you find yourself going through it, then what I would encourage you to do is to give it over to God, to let go, to say, God, this, this, this life, my life is not my life, that my life is not about me, God, it's about you. It's an acknowledgement that we can't do this alone, an acknowledgement of our need to surrender and to trust Jesus, to put him first in our lives. And this morning, we want to give you the opportunity to do that. Right now, our, our chat host is going to place an opportunity in the chat window for you, an opportunity for you to click and to say yes to Jesus. And here's what I'm asking you to do. Not only am I going to ask you to click and say yes to Jesus, but I'm gonna ask you to say, yes, you want prayer. And what's gonna happen is one of our hosts will connect with you right in that moment and pray with you and help you take your next step on this journey. Today is the day. And I know you can think of a lot of reasons why you shouldn't do this, but I can only think of one reason why you should. Because your life, it depends on it. Because your way won't work. Because Jesus offers for you something that you will find in no one or nothing else. Whether you're making the decision for the first time this morning, or you're recognizing just like the church in Colossae, that you have lost sight of your first love, Paul helps us understand our path forward. This is what he tells us to do. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope you held out in the gospel. The word there that Paul uses, faith, it comes from the Greek word pistis. You can say that at home. Everyone say pistis. Great job. The, the word pistis there is best described as the word commitment. And I think understanding that is so critical to understanding Paul's point. What Paul isn't talking about is a continued, uh, you know, continuing in our belief. It's not just an intellectual belief. Not that belief is bad, but if we read this and thinking it's just about continuing our belief, again, it falls short of Paul's intent. What he's getting at is that continuing in our commitment to Christ, no matter how bad our seasons are, no matter how difficult the struggle is, it's a commitment to stand firm, to not waver, 
from the hope that we have, a hope that is everlasting, a hope that is eternal, and a hope that can only be found in Jesus. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the words in your book. I thank you for a letter like the one that we're talking about this morning and over the next couple of weeks, this letter to the church in Colossae. God, the way it speaks into our lives and to these moments where we just feel like we're just going through it, God, it brings perspective. It helps us understand that you are in control, that you should be first in our lives and that we surrender it all over to you. God, I thank you for the people today who are making decisions. Whether those decisions are to trust you with their life for the first time or it's a recognition that we have wandered, that we have lost sight, that we have put other things first, God, and a recommitment to putting you back to the position you belong, God. We love you. We love your son, Jesus. We surrender our hearts and our lives to him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So each week we take communion. As followers of Jesus, we take communion to remember him and the sacrifice he made for us. So we could choose to be in a relationship with him. The night before Jesus went to the cross, he gathered his disciples and broke some bread, which was meant to symbolize his body that was given for us. He then took a cup of wine and told us that it represents his blood that was freely poured out for us. If you haven't come to the point yet where you feel comfortable taking communion, totally cool. Please don't feel like you have to. And to be clear, you do not have to believe yet to be welcomed here at Lake Sawyer. We love that we get to be a part of your spiritual journey, and we're going to do everything we can to answer any questions that you may have. And if you do have any questions at any time during the service, just press the live prayer button, and someone will join you in a private chat window. For the rest of us, grab some bread, some juice, and in the next minute or so, take communion wherever you are. Thanks to you, we have been able to serve our community in new ways as we continue to work to help people find and follow Jesus. For those of you who are already given to Lake Sawyer, thank you so much for continuing to be faithful in your generosity. I'm telling you, you really are making a difference in our community. If you'd like to give, you can do so by going to our website at lakesawyerchurch.org forward slash give. You can text Lake Sawyer to 77977. And you can also go to our Lake Sawyer app, which is available on your preferred app store. We hope you've really enjoyed the service today. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date on all the latest information. Registration for on-campus services is now live. We can't wait to see some of you next week at our on-campus service, which is at 9 a.m. Otherwise, we will see you right here next week. Thank you for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful week.